Back to here, focus Falcher. Hi, hello. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And I'm doing a follow-up video on the last one that I did, which was about the Firbulog, the ancient tribe of Ireland. Um, they have a bit of a, a tragic story. And I was surprised that many people actually commented in the last video and asked to know what was the rest of the story. So um, before we dive into that, I'd like to again start with gratitude and say thank you very much for all of you who are coming along and kind of connecting with us in YouTube here and popping in for the videos who are doing the liking and the subscribing. Um, it's really reassuring. And also, again, it's it's very stimulating for me to be able to go, oh, well, actually, you know, I've left this open loop because I felt I was over talking it, but then people actually want to know the rest of the story. So I'm grateful to kind of come back and to kind of fill those in. So um, what I will say first, though, is that I need to offer a bit of a correction to myself. I made an error in the last video, and it's important to make sure that I am catching that and self-correcting because misinformation, as you've seen in some of our other content, misinformation is pretty serious and pretty damaging. And so, you know, if I realize I've done something wrong, I do want to make sure I take responsibility for that. In the previous video, I said that um, one of the chieftains of the Firbolog that came out of Greece into Ireland was Slang, Slanga, um, whose son was Shreng, who was the champion who met the two of the Danon when they arrived. That was incorrect. Um, so it was actually, I misread the names and I got it confused. Slanga was not one of the, the chieftains, of the five chieftains who led the Firbolog back into Ireland. Uh, it was actually a guy called Slan, uh, S-L-A-I-N-E. Um, now, probably my brain skipped off it because thanks to modern media and the expression of the comic series 2000 AD, there is a character very much based on Celtic mythology, very much taking, you know, Irish mythology. Um, and he's known as Slain, who is supposed to be this Cuchulain esque character who goes into rages and kind of like, you know, uh, there's a lot of kind of artistic corruption may be taken there and that's where some of the misinformation about the Fomorians come because in this comic expression in this fiction expression the Fomorians are these monstrous creatures that come from under the sea and they have you know completely non-human like physicality in so many ways um they may be humanoid but they're like fish people and they're they're monsters really um but that's not true in the ancient lore and um, in the actual the Fomorian were just another tri tribe of people another group of humans um, who time and again kind of were at odds with the people of Ireland be it the tribe of Nemed who kind of were here before and were under oppression of Fomorians and then as we've seen throughout the later mythological cycles the Fomorians remain this ongoing threat which then leads to the second battle of Moitura where we have the invasion of the Fomorian hosts to kind of take by force what Brest could not keep by right rule. Um, so that is important to kind of take on board and to be aware of. And again, for me to make sure I'm correcting myself when I do make those errors. Um, so it was a guy called Slain, who was one of the, the five kings. And as the they come back into Ireland, they find Ireland empty. So the Fir Bullock kind of come back into the land of their ancient ancestors. They then take over and they begin to thrive and rule in the land. Um, and so it is a while later, a good while later, there's no, I haven't come across an exact timeline for how long the for, for, for Bullock were in control of Ireland before the two of the Danon arrived. Um, or if I did, it's not kind of stored in the bird brain. Um, but the king, as I mentioned, at that point in the first video, when the two of the Danon arrived was a guy called Uchid. And Uchid had this vision about the arrival of the two of the Danon. And he then had this foretold prophecy which was the doom, in essence, of his rulership, but not actually his people. And so I was talking more about, you know, the, the, the Fir Bollock themselves and how they arrived into Ireland, their backstory, surviving oppression in Greece, how they're known as the bag men, the fear being the Irish word for men, and Bollock being the Irish word for bag. And the stories are that they carried these clay in bags to kind of, what, what's the word? Um, oh, gosh. No, nope, I don't have it. <laughs> um, where you kind of change the landscape. Terraform? No, that's, in, that's on a planetary scale. Essentially, they cultivate the landscape that they're given in Greece to make it something that they can survive on and they can live on. But again, the, the story does not go well for them as they begin to thrive and grow as a tribe. Um, the, the Greek tribes say, listen, we need to move you on. You need to move on. And then eventually, like, you know, having 
been almost service in, in, in indentured servitude or kind of oppressed by the tribes there, they decide, fuck it, we're going home. We're going to the ancient home of our ancestors, which is Ireland. Um, so they take the bags and they make them into boats. And so then they're ready to leave. And as I mentioned in the last video, it's one thing that always entertains me. One of the chieftains is like, lads, I have an idea. <laughs> Before we go, let's you know take what we feel we deserve for the work we have done changing the landscape of Greece. Um, so they raid. They raid the heck out of the Greece tribes, loot all of their stuff, and then feck off back to Ireland. So the Fribulog are in Ireland for quite a while. They... Ireland is abundant. Ireland is this beautiful landscape. It is this fantastic kind of green, all woods. Like it's a very, the early kind of mythology as well gives a good description and view of Ireland in different contexts because we know that Ireland from a archaeological archaeological point of view was very much a primeval forest. It was very heavily forested. It was pretty much a, like an entirely arboreal island at one point. Um, because so many of the origin tales, so many of the feats that these champions and these heroes do involves clearing large sections of land. And so many plains and places in Ireland are named for the people who cleared the land to make room for the advent of agriculture in the early Neolithic kind of period. And so when we have the tales of the Fir Bullock coming in, it, it's not a case that they are living in an agricultural landscape because that actually comes later on the arrival of agriculture does seem to link with the Fomorian knowledge that we get from Bress. In fact, when Bress is put to, brought to bear really at the end of the second battle of Moitura, one of the offerings he gives to save his life is the knowledge of agriculture and how to cultivate, you know, harvests throughout the entire year instead of just once a year. Um, but again, I'm jumping around in time here. I need to be going back to the Fair Bullock. So, but what we have though is this, island that is very much a big primeval forest um which fascinates me i absolutely i'm a big tree person i love trees um and the idea of ireland being that kind of very broad very dense like old deciduous forest um just really sings to me but again as a culture then the for you know they are bag men you know there's, there's postulations, this theory that some of the name, like this fur bullock, this kind of bag thing, is that they were more hunter-gatherer, that they were, you know, they they actually lived by carrying the bags around and kind of gathering and kind of foraging was the main kind of sustenance that they actually did as a tribe. And um, that doesn't fully fit with the mythological cycle because we know that there was kingship, we know that there was tribes, and we know that they had a, a central form of rule when the two of the Danon arrived, because we have a singular king. So the Fir Bullock, the rest of the story, um, I brushed across it in the previous kind of talk. I teach a class on at the Irish Pagan School called The Taking of Ireland. Um, and it's a, a really comparison between the first battle of Moitura with the arrival of the two of the Danon versus the Fir Bullock and that exchange of power and rulership. And then the end, the, la the end of mythological cycle when the Milesians arrive and the exchange of power that happens between the two of the Danon and the Milesians. Um, but what we see in this first battle of Moitura is not a war of totality. Um, it is not a war of eradication. It is a striving between two different tribes to establish dominance in the landscape. And this is one thing which is very fascinating to me about the type of exchange that we have. This concept of total war doesn't really come into our understanding and our history until a lot later when we hit the kind of industrial revolution kind of period where an entire country is moved towards a war machine, where the entire kind of industry of a country um, from harvesting of foods to feed soldiers from harvesting of kind of like fabrics you know from making the weapons like this idea of total war is a much more modern kind of approach to conflict um where again as i said it's an entire kind of nation is industrialized towards a war effort which we have seen in in world war ii world war one etc but that's a different history class for a different time so what we have, though, is this conflict between two different tribes. And if you remember in the previous video, the first interaction we have between a, a member of the Fir Bullock and a member of the Tudor Danon is when Shwang, the champion of the 
Verbolog is sent to meet with the newly arrival tribe and he meets with Bress and they have a, a dialogue. They have a, an initial exchange where they realize they speak the same language. They're descended from the same tribe. You know, in a way they are, they have the same ancestors. They both come from tribes that are descended from the tribe of Nemeth. And this kind of connection, this realization kind of means that there is, there is an awareness of family or an awareness, an awareness of kinship. So even though we are generations and generations away, because the Semyon, the son of Nemeth, left with his tribe and went into Greece and he was 230 years there. And so his entire tribe became thousand strong. The sort of for Bullock before they came back into Ireland were thousand strong. And it was generations later, but there was still this recognition of family, still this recognition of kinship, that there was more that unified them in language, in history, in kind of ancestry than divided. Them. And so when Bress goes back to speak to Nuada, who was the king at the time, Nuada is like, okay, well, let's just send envoys. Let's send kind of the druids and let's send the bards to kind of have a conversation. So they go to the court of Ukhid and all really that they're asking for is half of the island. Listen, can we have a place? Can we split the island? Can we share it 50-50? We're both descended from the same kind of tribes. We're just coming to the land of our ancient ancestors. And, you know, from one perspective, it's a reasonable request. Um, but from another perspective, why? And this is this is where I, I personally believe I could get some bad advice because he's not too sure about what to do. So he calls in his chieftains, his other kind of lords within his tua, and he gets the bad advice, which is like, you know, well, if you give them half of it, you may as well give them all of it because they're better than us, which has been shown from Ukid's kind of prophecy and his, his oracle, his kind of view of the future, and that the two of the Dana would be greater than them in every strain. Um, so it's difficult. <laughs> and so they decide to go to conflict instead. But again, it's not straight to war. It's not like, you know, well, let's attack them straight off the beach and let's kind of just wipe them out straight away. You know, what they actually do is, Envoys are sent back and they return and they agree to have a conflict seven years from now. And so they are, the two of them arrive in, they agree that they're going to have a fight to establish the ascendancy for who's going to take over the rule of Ireland. They agree a place, which becomes the plane of Motor, the plane of pillars, and they agree that it's going to be in a couple of years. It's not going to be right now. One of the other things that is fascinating about this type of interaction is that they don't want the conflict to be won based on some superior technological advantage. And so smiths and weapon experts are sent between the two tribes to teach the two of Dan on how to make javelins, which was a, a technology that the Firbolog had, and to teach the Firbolog how to make spears, which was a technology that the two of Dan had, which is fascinating. Because then, like, you know, there's almost like these rules of conflict. There is this structure around which a battle must be had. Um, which we don't have as much kind of awareness of nowadays. But as we kind of look back at the old stories and how things are arranged, how conversation is talked about, and on, in the entire time when this is happening, Nuada is still sending envoys of peace. He's still trying, listen, can we just call off this fight? Maybe we can come to some other agreement. But at that point, the commitment has been done. And after the time has passed, the forces gather to the plane of Moitura. But even in the conflict, it's not a conflict of annihilation. It says that they fight during the day and every night they retire to their own camps and they're let, like they just leave. And in fact, the first fight, the first day, the Firbolog win it. You know, as much as the prophecy says that the two of the Danon are like a, a fleet of a thousand champions who will be victorious in every strain and will bring slaughter, the Firbolog are just tough enough and they will actually take them toe to toe. And the, the Firbolog take the first day, the two of the Danon take the second day, and the conflict goes back and forward. So as time begins to carry on, though, one of the more telling aspects in this conflict is the fact that the two of the Danon have a greater knowledge, knowledge of druidry and arts. I did a video about healing before, and we know that Dean Kex and his children had this ability to make a healing well. So they would actually make a trough, fill it with water, and they would put all of the various healing herbs in it, and they would chant over that to make it a well of restoration. So any warrior kind of without a mortal wound would step into the well and then they would come out completely healed. And that's one of the things that began to tell 
in the conflict. Um, so it doesn't go very well, eventually. You know, the Tula Danon take as many knocks as they give, but they have some advantage that they're able to kind of work forward with. And, you know, it comes down to it. Like it, it comes down to, you know, king to king almost, except Uchid sends in Shreng, his champion, and Shreng faces against Nuada. And as much as Nuada is armed with one of the four treasures of the Tula Danon, the Cleave Solace, the Sword of Light, he loses. He loses the Shreng. And not only does he lose the Shreng, he loses his arm. So I talk about that in another video, how that's a, a form of blemish on him. Again, it's the healing video. So that, that carries the day for the Fir Bullock and in that case, because they're like, hey, we took out the king. It's pretty much a given. But uh, whilst that conflict, conflict was happening, the dag that was on the left side of the field, um, what's his name? Al Avlok from Scotland and Norway. No, he was from Norway. Avlok from Norway was on the right-hand field and they had actually pushed back and destroyed the rest of the Firbolog force. So the center was held by Shrang, the champion. He beat Nuada, but the other champions took out the rest. Um, so as Nuada's healing, uh, Avlok from Norway ends up facing Shrang and he dies, but there's been enough damage done that the Firbolog can't actually sustain the battle. Um, and it does come to the last day. And in the last day, when the two of the Danon come to the field, the last of the Firbolog haven't kind of fled, haven't run away. They've actually gathered and they are standing like back to back as one group. They are just there. This is it. They're going to go out fighting to the last man. Um, and when Nuda approaches that, he offers single combat against Shrang. He's like, listen, we don't want to do this. We don't want to go to this annihilation. How about you and I fight like fairly and evenly? And we call the victory, the victory based on that scrap. Um, and Shrang is like, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. And Nuda's like, well, just bind up your arms so that like we can fight, both fight one-handed. Uh, because again, Nuda has only one arm at this point. And Shrang is like, it's not my fault you had your arm cut off. You know, why should I give myself a forcible disadvantage just because you are not able to kind of keep up? Which, again, very reasonable and very kind of smart about the circumstance. And Nude is like, yeah, you know, you're not right. But again, we don't want to go to this point of annihilation. And so they call it done at that point. They did, They agree then the war is ended. The two of the Danon will go to ascendancy within the island, but the for Bullock will go to Connacht one of the provinces. So the, the Firbolog tribe moved to the west coast of Ireland into Connacht um, and also into the islands out to the west of Ireland. So it is not the end of the story for the Firbolog there though, because there is then, I've mentioned it before, there's this kind of intermingling and, and blending of different tribes that we see time and again throughout the stories. One of the other very notable Firbolog people that, you know, is very influential when we look at the later stories in the mythological cycle on the run up to the second battle, Maitura, is Talchu. And Talchu is the foster mother of Lu. Lu, who is the Ildanach, he of many talents, who comes to Tara and then goes to the seat of the king in order to lead them in the forthcoming conflict for the second battle of Maitura against the Fomorian invasion. Lu was raised by a Firbolog Talchu was a Firbolog princess, and so he lived with his foster mammy, and he, she was such an influence on him that he became the Ildanok, this person of all of these talents, but also so much so that when she eventually passed, and um, actually she passed trying to clear, she, she herself cleared an entire plane. You know, and it, the efforts in her age kind of like caused her her life, but she again cleared an entire land. And when Lou kind of came to that, he was like, well, I need to honor that. And so he decided to host games on this brand new plane of Talchu. And those games were called the Lunasa games. And so now, even today, the Irish word for the month of August is Lunasa. And the name of one of the towns, the name of Talchu is still buried in Telltown, which is in Ireland today. So there's a town in Ireland called Telltown which is Talchu's town in essence. So when we talk about like the impact of this and how the mythology and the lore and the history is so very real and very present to us, it's because it's still in our lived language. It's still in our lived landscape. But again, Talchu was for Bullock. So there wasn't any kind of, and again, like she wasn't just, oh, well, yeah, here's this for Bullock we'll keep over there. She was a person of note. She was a person of like, you know, still status within the country despite the fact that her tribe was not an ascendancy 
And so fostering of children was a very, very, very big, important thing. And the fostering of a child wasn't always done Okay, in, in later times in the cycle of kings. It was done as a kind of like, listen, I'll, I'll raise your kids in my household to kind of make sure you don't be a dick to me because I've got your kids. But in the older kind of like, the theory is that in the older times, children weren't raised by one parental unit. They were raised by the community, by the two, by the tribe. And that's why there was so such a common fostering that all children born are children of the two, are children of the tribe, not just children of a one family unit, um, which, you know, opens up co-parenting stuff all over the place, which would be ideal if you had that shared kind of parenting understanding. So for Bullock, you know, they don't get annihilated. They don't get destroyed. They still exist at the end of that battle. And we see that they still, some of them still re remain prominent people within Ireland and this blending of the tribes. But there is still the old conflict. You know, there is still this knowledge that they were the, they were the ascendant tribe before the two of the Danon came. And so when, long time later, generations later, when the Milesians arrive, the Milesians kind of coming into Ireland find it a very difficult place to find because it's been kept um, behind these magical mists by the power, the sorcerer's powers of the two of the Danon. Um, so eventually when the tribes come in conquest from Spain, they, they actually Milesians come out of Spain, and they come in conquest for Ireland and they can't find Ireland because it's so obscured. But eventually they do. They call upon their own fella. In fact, a guy called Amergan Bloomgirl, Amergan Whiteney. And it's by his bardic power he is able to change and cast aside the mists because he's able to name things properly. The power of words is so crucially important that that is his sorcerer's manifestation. And they sail around the island and they come in on the west coast of Ireland. And in the west coast of Ireland, they find Fribullock. And so the Fribullock tribes in the islands out to the west, you know, seeing the arrival of another force, seeing arrival of like, you know, a, a conquering army, remember the old kind of grudges and they uh, they align themselves with the Milesians and they lead the Milesians into Ireland. Um, but that then puts them squarely between two superpowers of conflict. And that's the final tragedy, really, of the Fribullock. Uh, the ending of their tribe, the ending of their tale is as they try and you know, not exist and integrate, they, they choose the, the size of the conquerors. So even though, you know, the Milesians win, you know, it's not very, it doesn't go well for the for Brolog, unfortunately. And that's where we have the end of their line, the end of their tribe, because the Milesians kind of take complete control of Ireland and their chieftains then segment the land into how they're going to rule it. And there's no there's no space for the for Bullock after that. It's not a case that, you know, the for Bullock get their section of land which had happened under the two of the Danon, the Milesians come in and they just take complete control. Um, and it's with the arrival of the Milesians that we have the shift and the change of the two of the Danon, because thanks to, again, some rather tricky wordplay by Amergan, um, he agrees a contract. An agreement is that the, in order to prevent annihilation, um, the Milesians will take the top of the island and the two of the Danon will take the bottom of the island. And that's agreed. Both both tribes agreeing on it. But then thanks to tricky twisting of words, the Milesians are like, yep, so we'll take the top, which is everything on top. Which means that everything at the bottom is everything below the ground. And so by that kind of manipulation of words, the two of the Danon, the survival two, two of the Danon are then taken by Mon and MacLear into the hills, the hollow hills, which were known as the Shi, and then they become people of the Shi, they become people of the Hollow Hills. Um, so when we talk about the Shi in Ireland, we're not just talking about like, oh, fairy creatures or whatever. We're talking about the ancestral tribes of Ireland. And in fact, many of them are known as Aes Shi, which is an upper level or noble kind of noble Shi. And um, because there were Shi beforehand, the Shi existed in the Hollow Hills before the two of the Danon went into the Hollow Hills and became Aes Shi. But the Firbolog having a long ancestry, having a long and ancient kind of past and their own kind of culture and their own kind of interactions, you know, grew and changed as much as they could with the evolving times. But then the tragedy, the final tragedy is that, you know, when they aligned themselves with the Milesians to try and, you know, reestablish some dominance for their own tribe, 
they find themselves kind of ground between the two con two, two superpowers as it were of Ireland at that point and that is the end of the Verbullog unfortunately so thank you very much for being with us um I as I said it wasn't a really great or it doesn't have a happy ending for the Verbullog unfortunately but it is something to be aware of that there are these multiple tribes and that is one thing I always try and get across with my talk and with my own kind of exploration of the Irish mythology and folklore is that we're not dealing with one particular people we're dealing with an island and the island itself attracts many different tribes into the island but then also as their descendants kind of face oppression or challenges they emigrate out of ireland but then the love of ireland the memory of ireland something about ireland brings them back and so as a living Irish person, as a living Irish pagan who honors this mythology and this ancestry of my country, I find it a little bit difficult to stand beside people who do not accept refugees or other people into Ireland because Irish people have always been and will probably always be emigrating and immigrating. Ireland is a place of, you know, having tribes here and then growing and then going out from Ireland and then going back to Ireland. It's happened within my own family. My brother-in-laws, you know, have gone out to work and, and grow in Australia. One of them has come home to Australia. The other is living over in Australia, you know, and that's not an uncommon circumstance. Ireland is pretty small. Just <laughs> in case you don't know, <laughs> right? When we talk about Ireland, Ireland as an island, for me, it's a pretty big place because it's the place I've always been. But you can drive across Ireland from coast to coast, from the east coast to the west coast in about two, two three hours on the motorways. You can drive from the north to the bottom in about five hours, maybe five and a half if you want to go like tip to tip, um, again, using the motorways. So that to me seems like a, a long drive, but then I have people, friends of mine in the States who do a two hour commute to get to work. And I'm like, you could cross my entire island or pretty much cross my island in that time frame. So like Ireland is not huge, but its impact seems to be pretty big because there are many people out there who do feel the love of Ireland, do feel the call to Ireland, um, whether descended from Ireland, Ireland ancestry or not, you know? So, yeah, again, if people come to our country, you know, it's not a case that we should be defending against them. It's not a case where we need to be like, oh, well, we can't have people coming into our country because our country has always had people coming into the country. Now, again, it might be post-colonial trauma, post-oppression, and the fact that we have our own nation for just over 100 years now, the Republic of Ireland, that we're still precious of our own identity because it was eradicated from us. But the story has always been about, you know, the more the merrier, the more people we can get together, the more people we can bring to the table, the more crack, the more fun can actually be had, the more new experiences, the more new perspectives, the, the more we can grow collectively, not just as a nation, not just as an ethnicity, but as a, a, a world, as a, a species, as a human species upon this planet. So I do find it very hard where people like, you know, try and defend or it's the end of Irish culture. And we get accused of that. And in some of my partner's videos on the comments, both of us believe that you don't have to have Irish blood in your veins. You don't have to have Irish DNA in order to connect and appreciate and love Ireland. You know, and this is where we talk about appreciation, not appropriation. So if someone is taking Irish culture and then enhancing their own existence with us from a if they're profiting from it by intrinsically profiting or social profiting without kind of pointing back to where it comes from, then that's appropriation. But if they are just absolutely loving the culture, the history, the mythology, and they're still pointing people back to the roots, pointing back to the, the native resources, that's appreciation. And that's totally okay. So yeah, I'm getting into a rant and I said, I would talk about your bullock. I didn't say I would you know, drop a surprise rant on you at the end of the video, but Really, I hope that has been a nice insight for you. I hope that's a, a perspective that there are many different tribes and it's the combination of those many different tribes that do make the world what it is. And we see that time and again in the Irish lore and in Irish culture. And as we have said, even in my lifetime, people going out of Ireland, taking the love of Ireland out to other countries and sharing that around those countries or building those countries in many ways, you know, 
it all then still comes back and Ireland has a bigger impact on the world than we sometimes should. Well, no, actually, no, I think we do have a big impact in good ways um, as a country that you can drive across inside two hours. Um, sorry, three hours on the motorways being legal. Got to be safe. Safety first. So thank you very much for being here. Hopefully that has been a good answer, a good resolution to the, the story of the Fir Bullock. Uh, again, it's not a, a happy ending. It doesn't have a happy ever after, I'm afraid. But not every story does and not every story should. Because the big meaning of all of these stories is that we learn something from it, that we take something from it. And that's, again, going back to the ancient Irish bard tradition, we don't tell stories for no reason. Every story we tell has some meaning, has some lesson, has some moral of the story to take on board and to consider. So if you've enjoyed this story, maybe consider what can you take from it? What is your teaching or learning point from it? You know, I haven't woven any specific one in. OK, well, maybe my rant. I've had a little bit of my own personal takings from the story, but I'd like to hear yours. So if you feel inclined, pop down into the comments and tell me what, what you took from the story. What is it that you kind of caught on you? And you're like, oh, actually, you know, I'd love to hear that too. And again, from us here at the Irish Pagan School, Gaurav Magas, thank you very much. Look after yourself, take care of yourself, and I'll see you the next time. Goodbye. Slán. <laughs>